Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. That's been around for a long time. In fact, it goes all the way back to 1719 when Isaac Watts wrote the words of joy to the world. I want to teach you something today. You ready? That's all three of you. I got three, three answers there. That's good. Would you take your Bible? And I want to show you where this song originated from. So back in the Psalms, if you'll turn there for just a moment, I hope you'll add this to your thinking today and to the worship of uh, the day as you think about joy to the world. But back in Psalm 96, verse 11 and 12, let's just make a note there as we think about joy today, joy to the world. Look what the psalmist says. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound in all that is in it, let the fields be jubilant and everything in them, then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. Where did Isaac Watts get inspiration for the hymn, the Christmas carol that we sing, Joy to the World? There it is. Skip over just to the 98th Psalm. This also was in his thinking as he wrote these words long ago. But verse 4, again, is the message of joy. So Psalm 98, 4 says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. And if you read through the entirety of that psalm, it will say it over and over again. Uh, Be happy, be joyful, shout your praise to God for all that he has done and for who he is. Christmas is designed, intended to be a joyous time of year. Now, thinking about Christmas and thinking about the story of Jesus, there was a prophecy that Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, would would be born. But in the story of Jesus, in the gospel story, there is also waiting. Do you like to wait? Most of us don't like waiting. We don't like when we get delayed by a stoplight. We don't like when we text somebody and don't get a return text. We don't like a slow drive through window. We just don't like to wait. But the story, the gospel, the message of Jesus, the joy filler, it wasn't instant. It was a story that had delay and waiting involved in it. Now, the prophets would say it many times. For example, Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. Isaiah was saying, hey, there is coming uh, a child, a Savior, a special one in the days. But they had to wait. Isaiah said it. Micah said it. He said something about this as well in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem... um, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So the story of the Savior took time to come true. And there was waiting. I've mentioned we don't like to wait. I read some words from... Andrea Lennon, um, author and women's ministry leader in our state and beyond, and she said something about waiting. I thought it was so good. 
This is what she wrote. She said, waiting is one of the hardest things that we are called to do. In times of waiting, we can wonder if God sees, cares, and remembers us. One thing we can learn from the Christmas story is that our timing and God's timing don't always line up. We may never understand why we must wait, but we can learn something from the 400 years of silence. And then she made the comment, God works in the waiting. What I'm trying to do is to to take you back in your mind and to think about the prophet saying, there's coming one who will bring joy into the world. But it took time. They had to wait. Finally, the day came. Finally, the period came in the fullness of time. God's set ways. The time came for Jesus to be born. And there was excitement. There was celebration. There was joy in the moment and the occasion of God coming into this world. Now, you've heard that dozens of times, hundreds of times. Uh, You know the story of Christmas. It's well rehearsed. Don't let it go through one ear and out the other. Let it lodge today in your life that God came in Jesus to this earth, the incarnation of Christ. And with it is a message of great joy. Luke is the writer of the gospel that we read from so often in this season of the year. Luke chapter 2, verse 10, says it this way. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Here is a joyful announcement. Interesting, if you break it down, we won't get heavy and hard on this, but, you know, do not be afraid. Maybe you came to church today. Maybe you're online. Maybe you're a teenager. Maybe you're a senior adult. And today, right now, you are afraid. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, there's not reason to be scared or afraid or anxious. There is. But maybe you came afraid of something, There's a lot of fear running through our world today. The reminder of Christmas is do not be afraid. It is a picture of a world that is consumed by sin instead of the love of God. So do not be afraid. It's a good word of admonition for all of us. The angel made the announcement, I bring. And I just got to stop because I really learned this for the first time this week. I bring. This is Luke talking. And he says in this expression, I bring you. He, he uses this expression 10 times in the gospel of Luke. And in fact, in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 11 times this particular expression is used. 10 of the 11 are found in Luke's gospel. And he says, I'm delivering, I'm bringing something to you. And of course, we read it and we we know what he's saying. I bring you good news. Well, this is the season of the year for deliveries. (laughs) Seen any uh, FedEx trucks running around? Amazon? The mail system, you know, I mean, people are delivering, they get up early and go late and they deliver in your neighborhood and mine and they're making deliveries, putting them on the front porch of our homes. There's a time for delivering something. Well, the message of Christmas is God delivered a baby who was more than a baby and they delivered Jesus to this sin ridden world and it brought in doing uh, so good news. It was good news. I think we've had about as much bad news as we can stand in 2020. We need some good news. So rehearse the story. Don't let the world dominate your life in thinking. Rehearse the story of Jesus and let the good news of not only the season but of the message of the gospel Fill your mind and let it be something that you think about over and over again. This is good news. I'm not here to be a bad news preacher. I'm here to be a good news preacher. Because that's the gospel. The gospel is not about you. The gospel is about him. The gospel delivered to us sinners in Christ and the one that came to give us this great message of good news. And then it says it will cause, and here's the whole idea today, it will cause great joy for the people. 
Do you know that the adjective that is used there for great joy is the word mega? Jesus coming brings mega joy. I've heard of mega markets, things that are large scale. The good news of Jesus brings this great joy to the world. I need that in 2020. And I think we all need it in our lives as we think about Christmas. Interjected into a dark world way back then is hope with the joyful birth of Jesus. And good news, which we all like, brings some emotion with it. Now, this is a poor illustration. I'll admit that up front. But I'm going to say it's hard to contain good news. So I've been wanting a Jeep for a long time. Years. And finally, I think I wore Judy down earlier this year. And she finally said, you can do it. And I have to tell you, I I mean, this is not a great illustration. It's pretty (laughs) worldly. But, uh, you know, I got a Jeep. And I like it. I like sitting in it. I like driving it. I think I'm a cooler pastor in that Jeep than I was. No, that's, I don't know. I've been looking forward to that and, you know, to go places I could go with a Jeep that I couldn't go with a car. And when the, Judy said yes, I said, that's my Christmas present for the next decade. That's all I need. I don't need anything this year over the, until it breaks down. But that was a good news thing. In fact, I'll get on with it. But one night, you know, after I got this Jeep, I just went out in the garage. This is silly, but I went out in the garage and just sat in it for a while. (laughs) Wow, look at all these features. That was good news. Something that far surpasses that silly illustration is the good news of Jesus. His entry into the world brings to us what we need the most. And so, Among all the doom and gloom, all the suffering and pain and the realities of the hardest year people have experienced maybe in all their life, amongst all of that, there is a joyful announcement that we need to hold on to and say, I I hold on to the good news and the great joy that comes in Christ. I mean, Advent is peace and Advent is joy. It's a joyful announcement. And joy, as you think about just those three letters, that little word joy, joy is central to the Christian life. It is core to who we are. Doesn't Proverbs 17, 22 say, a joyful heart is good medicine? And I think that's simple, but it's so true. Charles Spurgeon was a preacher from a long time ago, but he had this great statement about joy, and I want you to see it and maybe capture this, but this is what he said about joy. He said, of joy, there is a marvelous medicinal power in joy. Most medicines are distasteful, but this, which is the best of all medicines, is sweet to the taste and comforting to the heart. This blessed joy is very contagious. One unhappy spirit brings a kind of plague into the house. One person who is wretched seems to stop all the birds from singing wherever he goes. But the grace of joy is contagious. Holy joy will oil the wheels of your life's machinery. Holy joy will strengthen you for your daily labor. Holy joy will beautify you, and give you influence over the lives of others. Joy is just one of the best words there is. Joy to the world. I mean, we celebrate birthdays and graduations and weddings and promotions and retirements. Christmas 
is a celebration of the incarnation of the Christ child, of Jesus, the Savior of the world. And so we remind ourselves that joy is to be part of who we are in our Christian walk. And, and you're trying to build your life for God. You want to live and be a man or a woman of God. You want to put the things together that will make your life and character and, and life speak of growing in and with God. Then in your spiritual formation, you cannot leave out joy. I mean, you talk about Bible reading and prayer and all, all the elements that are very important, but in the spiritual formation that God allows us to grow in, we are to carry and practice joy. It is a very important part of a growing Christian's life. I've got a number of quotes I just want to share with you today. A man by the name of R.A. Torrey, a um, long time ago again, but he said, there is more joy in Jesus in 24 hours than there is in the world in 365 days. And then he said, I have tried them both. Joy. Lewis Smead says it this way, a Christian theologian and writer, he says, to miss out on joy is to miss out on the reason for your existence. I mean, God delights in you. God delights in his creation. He didn't make you to be miserable. And if we go through our days and our decades and our lifetime and we never joy in God, then we miss it. Christmas reminds us that joy is part of our birthright. A missionary by the name of E. Stanley Jones said, I love this, when I met Christ, I felt like I had swallowed sunshine. <laughs> I've been around Baptists for a while. Some Baptists need to swallow a little bit more sunshine. Joy is a part of our life, our character, our calling. C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. Heaven's going to be joyful, filled with it. And it is currently. Joy is in the list of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Remember that list? The fruit of the Spirit, the nine words that are the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. So joy is a part of Holy Spirit living in you. There'll be joy. The Apostle Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Like we need reminders. Rejoice in the Lord. Paul was heavy on joy as he spoke and as he wrote. Here's the deal. Joy is a sign that you are living in a different kingdom. I mean, this world, there's a lot of despair. But joy says you are a citizen, a resident. You have one foot in a different kingdom already. You're here, but you're there. And the kingdom of God is designed to include and to practice joy. It's really an important thing in our lives. Now, I'm a realist, and I understand, and want to ask you a good question, and I think maybe this might help us today. Is it possible to have joy in difficult times? Because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I... I'm having a whole lot of trouble right now getting in the Christmas spirit. I don't have a lot of joy. And I know there have been some serious losses and setbacks and pain over the last number of months. In the midst of the difficult suffering and setbacks, can you still have joy? I think that's a timely question. And I'm reminded of a man named Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And some of you know his story, have, written, have read his biography and his stand as a German pastor under Hitler and his uh, imprisonments. Somebody that was imprisoned with 
Diedrich Bonhoeffer looked at him and recorded this about Bonhoeffer in the midst of hard times. Bonhoeffer, quote, always seems to me to spread an atmosphere of happiness and joy over the least incident and profound gratitude for the mere fact that he was alive. I don't think there could have been anything easy about it. I don't think there's anything easy about 2020 and all the disruptions of your life. But joy is possible in the midst of suffering. Mother Teresa ministered to the poor and marginalized and sick. She did that for years. She was a humble servant, quiet servant of God in so many ways as she worked in the streets of large cities. And they talked about her life. You would think that she'd be the most miserable person to see things like she saw time after time, disease and sickness and the lowest of life. But those that watched her life said that she had a joy as she ministered mercy to people. God's good for the good days when everything's easy, but God's enough and sufficient for the days and the years when it's really hard. And you may be online today or you may be in here and I have no idea, but in your heart or in your mind, the things that are churning right now and got you all twisted and uptight may be overwhelming. I remind you that a child named Jesus came, not to make you more miserable, but to stand with you and to give you joy. Even in the hardships of life, joy is part of the faith. You might make a note of it. The devil is anti-joy. That's where he exists. That's what he's about. The the devil is anti-joy. Steal, kill, destroy. It is a negative bent. It is a way that is totally opposite of God. God is joy. The devil is anti-joy. Tells me that God did not create you to be grim, sour-faced, judgmental, negative. God created you to cultivate joy in your life to give you full life, real, lasting, profound joy. And that'll work for somebody in their mid-30s. That'll work for somebody in their mid-60s. That'll work for somebody in their mid-90s. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is strength in our lives. You know, part of being a preacher is going to meetings. (laughs) Lots and lots of meetings. Meetings online these days. Any of you tired of Zoom, by the way? Yeah, it's kind of of wear us out sometimes. But, you know, meetings. So I'm on a, having a Zoom meeting this past week, talking with some people, decisions being made, thinking about the future, and on this Zoom call, there is a man. I, I call him a refresher. Because in the midst of all the call, he's the guy that says, well, he's, he, he's positive, and he's helpful, and he's engaged, and he's thinking forward, and He's willing and serving in any way I can help. And I got off that call and I thought, man, that, the tone of that man's life just ministers grace and joy. And, I, and so I just texted him. I said, hey, you, you are a refresher. And thank you for that. Because I think in refreshing there is a bit of God. 
right? Broken world, dark world, hurting world. God came to refresh and bring joy to this world. It's Advent story. It's a reality of Christmas. You cannot think of Christmas without knowing that joy is real. I want to cultivate, ask you to cultivate joy in your life. Many of you do this, but it's just a reminder for me and for you. I mean, I'm still, I got so much to learn on this, but joy, what are you going to cultivate if God gives you next year? And I want to say as your pastor, your friend, I want to say one thing we should all want to cultivate and grow is joy. More of that. The devil is anti-joy, but God's people are joyful people. That's our birthright. That's our DNA. We are joyful. So let me ask you today, only you can answer this. Are you a joyous person? And the challenge of the word today, the gospel is to take the message of a birth and a Savior and a Christ and the good news and and to take the gospel and carry it in a positive, winsome, honest way into a world that says, I don't know what you're talking about when you talk about joy. So we have to think about being joy carriers Let's spread some delight. Let's spread some happiness. Let's spread some joy into our world. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. I got to go quick. So just simple. Christmas one would be God's protection. God gives us protection. Psalm verse, chapter 5, verse 11 But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them that those who love your name may rejoice in you. One reason we can be joyful is that God is a refuge. He's a safe place. He's a place that you can take shelter in when you feel pressured and overwhelmed. Why can we find joy at Christmas? Because there is security in Christ. This baby anchors our life. He secures us through all the winds and storms and tests of our life. To find security in Christ is to be protected. I hope today that you're safe in Him. Whatever happens, if you know Him, He's yours. Another reason we can be thankful at this Season of the year, Christmas reminds us about joy and the fact that it tells us that God is not only protector, but He is also present. He is a living presence in our life. Psalm 21, 6, if you're making notes. Surely you have granted Him unending blessing and made Him glad with the joy of your presence. I love to know the fact that We can be in the presence of God. Here is something maybe we could all do and all be better for for it. We could go home and at some point in these weeks, you know, Christmas season, we could could turn off the TV and we could power down the, the social media and we could get real simple. And it sounds really easy, but I, I think it's really hard to do. We could turn it all off. And just sit in his presence. Just delight in knowing in that quiet place and moment that he is our God and we are his people. The the, the world is loud. There's always something to do. But to turn it down and get quiet and be in the presence of God is to know that he cares for you. So very much. You're not a stranger. You're a name to God. You're a person. You're valued. He knows you and loves you. And to be in his presence gives us strength and confidence. Maybe we need that as much as anything in 2020. Just to let God, if I I could say it this way, just to let God hug us. 
We haven't hugged most people. You know, can't do that anymore. Would you let God bring you a joyful hug this season of the year? His presence in a quiet moment. Everything else turned off, just tuned into him. His presence. Now, I guess I'm in my sermon for quoting songs today. Joy to the world, right? We started with that. This is different. You don't have to admit it because it's kind of way back there a little bit too, but any of you remember a song called Stand By Me? 1961, Ben King recorded this number one song. There have been over 400 different versions of the song Stand By Me rendered, shared with the world. I know you don't want me to sing it. But maybe we could apply it to what God says to us by means of presence. When the night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see, no, I won't be afraid, oh, I won't be afraid, just as long as you stand by me, stand by me. If the sky that we look upon should tumble and fall or the mountains should crumble to the sea, oh, I won't cry, I won't cry, no, I won't shed a tear, just as long as you stand by me, stand by me. I know today that God stands with us, and that brings joy. His protection, His presence, finally, His salvation. Psalm 51, verse 12, written by David after his life had been at its lowest ebb of dark moment, journey, affair, murder, all the background of this king, King David. Psalm 51, verse 12, restore to me the joy of of your salvation, and grant me, your, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David cries out for a salvation joy that he had known at one time but had lost and need it refreshed in. We need that as well today. We need the salvation that only a Christ child can bring. Some people are calling it a Christmas miracle. This past Wednesday in Texas, around Mission, Texas, there was a four-year-old boy that was, as you've probably seen, rescued, saved from falling down nine feet into a water well. It was 44 feet deep. He fell nine feet down in this eight to ten inch diameter. He was there lodged for some six hours and rescue team showed up and they worked hard and they chiseled away and the victory was that they rescued, they say they delivered this little boy from that bad place. We deserve a bad place. Sin wrecks our life and plunges us deep away from God. But the mercy of God leads to Jesus who came to pull us up and to rescue us, to brush us off, and to say, now you can have a joy like no other. Joy is yours. May we live in the joy of the gospel. Is there room today in your heart for the joy of this gospel, this good news, not just at Christmas, but every day of the year?